Greetings and love here from Show for London in the United Kingdom. Um, I want to just share a few things with you as I believe God is leading us at this time. And um, I uh, was actually pondering the other day just how God was blessing myself in being part of such a blessed movement. And I was just thinking of David and his mighty men. If you go and read it in 2 Samuel 23, it says actually that he had a few mighty men around him that he recognized, um, you know, at the end of, of his life. And um, some of them actually ki killed 800 men at a time. Uh, extraordinary things that happened um, through David's life. And uh, when you read those stories, you, you can just imagine that it's not just about the killing and the great wars that they fought, um, but it was the just the being together, the relationships that was forged and just the cause that they fought for. And, um, and uh, it makes me think of just the times that we are living in and as a church, where do we find ourselves in globally in pursuing God's purpose together and fulfilling his mandate as the kingdom. And you look at uh, Jesus' life and you uh, just realize that the greatest legacy that Jesus left behind was his solution to the earth. And his solution was to send 12 men to go and change the world, impart it into their lives. And he gave us the exact answer for the times of Roman occupation um, until today where we experience a lot of onslaught from secular humanism and oh, so many other flows that's coming against us um, as the church today. And we realize that the answer still stays the same. It's the relationship between 12 men that um, were so radical for the cause of Christ that they would lay down their lives for it. And my question to the church today is, are we at the same place? Are we also committing ourselves to, to be the disciples that Christ has called us to, to be? And now we know that disciples meaning disciplined ones, ones uh, following Christ and becoming like Christ and doing the things of Christ. And so we must have honest assessments with ourselves. Are we really, you know, the disciplined ones? Are we the ones that represent Christ so much that the world can say that his light is shining through us? And so, uh, so I want to actually speak about building a culture of discipleship because I believe that is the answer to the times that we are living in. And, and even in these uh, COVID-19 lockdown times, we've, we've realized how important relationships are and how important it is to pursue those in our lives. Now, I can just uh, you know, testify in my own life, uh, my own mother and father not being perfect uh, by no means, but um, just the amazing things that they've imparted into our lives as children into uh, sending the legacy of Christ, not just um, through through themselves, but um, through us to the world. Uh, such a beautiful picture. And they've been so committed through the years. You know, those moments that you want to go on holiday and um, or just out of the house to the beach, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and your parents say, no, listen, we're first going to read Bible together as a family. You know, um, those times that um, my dad would pull us together and just say, listen, Let's pray for this person before we go on with life. You know, um, moments of discipline, that mo moments we, we were committed to the cause of Christ. And uh, those were principles that was laid in my life that I still today treasure. You know, uh, I've got such an appreciation even for the, the show for church that, I've, that I'm in. You know, the, uh, the guys that kept me in accountability when I started off in show for and I remember you know, uh, fighting on the rugby field. And uh, I was sent to, to the Sinbin uh, behind the, the rugby poles. And, and, you know, how afterwards I've been scrutinized and, you know, um, <laughs> you know, really uh, the friends in the, in, you know, in Christ really uh, speaking into my life and said, listen, this is not how it works. You must, you know, represent Christ well. And, you know, those moments in my life were so defining in, um, in fulfilling the call of Christ in, in my life. And, and I want to encourage you today that um, the church must come back to the principles of discipleship, of, um, 
allowing ourselves to be discipled by one another. And one challenge that I've realized for us as a church, you know, because we started off with, you know, the question, how do we disciple? And um, and I soon realized that as we did outreaches here in the UK and we got people saved, the problem was not getting people saved. The problem was to get people discipled. And the reason for that was actually that um, most people within the church are not discipled themselves. And uh, if you ask them, listen, um, you know, uh, can you disciple this person after they got saved? I realized that they didn't have the confidence to actually do so because they've never been um, discipled. Now, I also realized that, um, you know, in, in the days that we are living in, we see it as a course. We see it as just give the tools in my hand and I will be able to disciple somebody else with the same principles. And uh, people are waiting for um certain principles that they can go and impart in other people. And this is not what I'm talking about. Um, when it gets to discipleship, it's actually just duplicating whatever Christ has done in your own life. And that is a road, a commitment to walk with people. And this is so counter-cultural these days because we are all just focusing on our own agenda and our own calling and our own um, agenda. And we are forgetting that it takes time to disciple other people. It takes time to invest um, whatever we received over years from different sources in our lives um, into other people's lives. And that's the main thing that we find difficult uh, in discipling other people is to, to set time aside to really see other people coming to, to their fruition because we're so busy with our own agendas. And that's why I want to say I'm a disciple maker because I'm a disciple. I must first be discipled myself. I must allow people to speak into my life so that I can grow. And I'm not just growing for my own sake. I'm growing so that I can make other people grow. Um, because if that is the focus, you know, for me as a father, I realized with my own children, it's so difficult to, to, uh, to get the balance always right between discipline and, um, and in encouragement, you know, to exhort them, to bring hope in their lives. Um, and um, But the beautiful thing uh, of it is that, um, you know, I'm growing as a dad, that, uh, that I also don't have all the answers, but I must grow as a dad in order to let my, my children grow. And so that, that must be the attitude within the church in establishing a discipleship culture as well, is the fact that we need to become fathers that grow not for our own sake, but we grow because other people are going to grow through our growth. And if that is the aim, we all know how it works with, um, with uh, receiving knowledge. If you know that you will have to duplicate that knowledge, if you know that you're going to become a doctor one day and you are learning and getting information to, uh, to become that doctor, you know that you must make sure to get that information right. And it's not just about learning this stuff, it's about duplicating it afterwards, about the way in which you can actually um, apply that knowledge so that you can uh, save people's lives. Now, this is ex exactly the same in the church. Many times we find ourselves in a position where we are so busy um, building ourselves and getting it right within um, becoming greater and better Christians ourselves that we forget that the main aim is that we are supposed to duplicate, that we are learning because we are going to duplicate it in somebody else's life. And, and we would actually be so much more passionate even about receiving information if we know that we will have to duplicate. Now, I want to just say, one thing that I realized in the United Kingdom and in Europe, our biggest challenge here is the fact that the family culture is not established. I had this question from one of the pastors here. He said, why is it easier to disciple people in Africa? And, um, and my answer was just that, uh, you know, because the basics of family life and impartation is already established. Um, children know that they must receive from their fathers and they must be quiet and now just receive. And that established a culture where, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, 
uh, obedience and a willingness to receive. Now, we struggle here that uh, people have so much their own opinions. I mean, children from a small age already know more than their parents, um, and they think so. <laughs> they really believe that. Um, and that makes it very difficult to disciple people if they don't know that they need a cure. Um, and so exactly the same thing happens within uh, establishing a culture of discipleship. And so I want to just mention two things um, today that's going to help you in establishing such a culture within the church and, um, and within your lives. So the first one is renewal only takes place when we change our current culture. And this is intentional. This is not something that will just happen in your church. It's not something that will just happen in your household. It's not something that will just happen in your life. This is very intentional to change your lifestyle toward one of a discipleship culture is one that you must commit yourself to. And so, so the first thing about this renewal that needs to take place is that culture only change by a desperate desire to change. So does history. We know that radical changes had to happen in, in history in order to see a revolution. Uh, to, in o order to see a renaissance. Um, you know, people had to make radical changes in the communities that they were in. And they were, they were so desperate to see the change that they were willing to change their lives. Now, we've seen it in the COVID-19 as well. And it brings a lot of frustration to, to bring about the change. But uh, let me rather use the example of a work that you've done in the past, you know, a, a job. Um, you get to such a place of desperation that you are willing to change anything in your environment to take on a new job, to get a new environment and to, um, and to change things in your life, uh, just to get a new clean slate. But, you know, it's a desperate desire to see change. And so within our lives, if we are not willing to see a desperate change happening and make radical changes to do so, nothing is going to change. And, um, and so you must get so fed up with the old way of doing things that you are willing to make the changes to accept the new. The second thing about renewal um, in order to get a culture established of discipleship is just a radical pursuit is, is needed. Excellence. The fact that you can't do things half-hearted. Half-hearted um, commitments brings half-hearted results. And, um, and that is so true in, in life. You know, if you don't give it your best shot, uh, it's not going to, to help at all. Now, this is where I think most churches and most people in their lives to become disciples and to, to, in, um, to, to accept discipleship in their lives make the mistake is that we want to just change a few things um, in our daily routine, um, in our lives, in our commitments, even in our budget. Um, and, um, and then we think that, you know, we're going to be, become disciples. Disciples are people that are wholeheartedly committed to the cause of Christ. To become like Jesus and his commitment in the New Testament. <laughs> And this is difficult. This is not an easy pursuit. And, um, and so we see David spending his whole life um, with one heart's desire, and that is to build God a house. And so in order to build God a house, he was willing to stay in the wilderness, um, to repent whenever was needed, and then to come to the end of his life, to, um, to the place where God says to him, no, you actually... Um, was disqualified because of the bloodshed and because of the sins in your lives, uh, your son will do this. And it was, it was a great disappointment to David, but I can tell you, David accepted it and he understood that God's ways are better than his. But he was committed to what God called him to do. The uh, opposite was true in Saul's life. Saul was um, committed to build this great army and to go into war and battle for um, God's kingdom, so that his glory as the king would uh, look good, so that he would actually look like a good king for Christ. 
and, um, and the focus was so misplaced. And so I can tell you when it gets to discipleship, it's not about what you can establish in this life, um, but um, it's about um, pleasing the king, about a radical pursuit and a commitment. And I believe in Shofar, this is the one gift that God has given us through the years, is a radical pursuit to, to change our lives and to do crazy things even uh, for Christ's sake. And so if we want to establish that uh, culture of, of discipleship, we will have to get back to the radical things. And I often hear, even in our own midst, that, yeah, it's easy to do that when you're a student and you get saved, you know, as a student and you can, you know, with the, the, the time that you've got at hand and the fact that you're single, um, can do lots of things for Christ, but it's a lot more difficult when you are in a family. And I want to just challenge you today in saying that, you know, you will not be the disciple that Christ um, called you to be if there's not a radical pursuit to always please him, to always do what he wants in your life, even though it's going to let you look um, crazy. So so I had people even in the past saying to me, yeah, you know what, but in my job, I'm um, at my workplace, I'm, um, you know, also pursuing the kingdom. And this is where the real kingdom is, you know, not um, the uh, the church necessarily. And I totally agree, you know, is that we must go outside of the church. But we must also remember that the church is the vessel of honor that Christ has, has um, you know, called us to uh, in order to disciple people, the place of safety. And so my question would always be to even people in the workplace, you know, how many people did you raise up and disciple uh, while being at work? How many disciples can you say is radically um, fulfilling God's plan and purpose for their lives. And so the church is in a very fortunate position that it actually facilitates, you know, a radical change and make, and gives the platform for people to, uh, to be radical in, in their commitments to Christ. And it makes room for that. While you are sometimes limited in the secular sphere, and we should not be because we must live out Christ to the full, um, the Christ is the breeding platform, the, the place of safety where people can pursue um, the radical change that God wants to bring in their lives. And so the third thing about the renewal is the one of a supernatural intervention that is necessary in our culture. You know, we can't serve Christ in the church and not see his mighty manifestation of his presence and, and his being, bringing heaven to earth and seeing, um, you know, God's glory being established through our lives, that cannot happen if, if uh, you know, we are committed to discipleship. Because then it, um, it takes the focus to us. If we are so great in discipling people and to, in relationship, always raise people and do amazing things for Christ, the glory will come to us. But when we enter into the divine, we must always give the glory to God. And so... The pursuit to see um, the manifestation of the divine in our everyday life always brings us back to the glory to God. And, and then also the greater testimonies um, that will be established among us because we will be committed to what Christ is doing in people's lives. So, so never have a meeting without expecting um, the divine, the intervention of the supernatural to happen in and through your lives. Because discipleship cannot be in a place where it's only our efforts that counts. We must pray for people and trust that God will uh, intervene in their lives and, and bring supernatural testimonies. And so this leads us to a prophetic culture of following God's agenda above our own. We, where we pray for people not out of our own um, understanding and wisdom, but because we receive wisdom from God and intervention of his supernatural wisdom and agenda in their lives, and we can speak it into being. We can, we can proclaim it over their lives and we can see the, the breakthrough that it brings. And so um, Matthew 11 verse 5 to 14 actually speaks of this. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. You know, that, that is the responsibility when it gets to a culture of discipleship is to, 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 to see these things happen in our time. 
you know, to, to trust God for it and to, um, to every day be confronted with the fact that we have the ability to duplicate Christ through his divine um, intervention. And then Isaiah 35, verse 1 to 4 says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad, the desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Um, faith gets important. Whenever you spend time with Christ, um, you know, you have the ability to walk past people and they start to get healed. Um, but the more we spend time and rub off on, um, you know, the heavenly realm and uh, the presence of Christ, the more we will have the ability to duplicate that in other people's lives, um, to, uh, to bring heaven to earth. And so the, the last one in renewal um, in a culture that is needed of discipleship is that the only constant is change. We change to adapt to God's plan. Physical changes are needed to embrace spiritual transformation. If we want to see this culture happening, you know, we need to make certain changes um, by physical decisions that we make in, um, in not just talking God's plan into action, but uh, by doing God's plan so that it can come to, to fruition. And, um, and this is a great commitment to always be obedient to Christ, to change your agenda and your lifestyle and, um, and your comfort so that you will be able to, uh, to fulfill His. And so this is how, you know, we need to, to, to change the culture, to renew the culture in order to get to discipleship. But secondly, we need to actually come to a renewal that takes place when we have a team. And so while first we need to change the culture, I can tell you when it gets to discipleship, we need a team in order to fulfill that. Christ immediately started to build a team when he was released to start to do ministry. And he knew that it was not just about um, the glory of God through his life, but the ability to, um, to transform other people's lives so that they can transform. So Five things that I'm quickly going to mention to you about how do we get there? How do we actually build that team? The first one is you need to build towards something. Um, without a clear vision being set, you cannot bring hope. And without hope, people with us. Um, and so what happens if we do not communicate vision? Jeremiah 8 verse 6 says, that I've paid attention and listened, but they have not spoken rightly. No man relents of his evil, saying, what have I done? Everyone turns to his own course, like a horse plunging headlong into battle. And so I can tell you, if we start to live in a discipleship culture, we need to lead the people that are um, in our lives. Because otherwise, without a clear set vision, uh, people will find their own. We must be clear about, now I know Shofar has a, a clear vision of reaching um, nations and generations through discipling, uh, leadership development and church planting. That is our vision. And that is close to, you know, the vision that Christ has, has left us. But I also have a, you know, appreciation for the prophetic direction that God um, leads us in our communities. The fact that God has given us a plan, a purpose in our communities to bring about change. And so for every church community, it's, it's different because the um, strategy that God has for the region that you are in, um, you know, is different. But you need to together find that vision uh, so that you can be obedient to that and that you can pull one another together. Otherwise, everyone will pull uh, in their own direction. Um, and a, a mixed-up vision produced confusion, mixed messages, and mixed priorities. And, um, 
And we need to teach the alignment of everyone in the vision that God has given us to, uh, to be part, to, um, to value the other people around them and the contributions that different people bring in establishing um, the vision that God has given us. So, um, so we need a vision, first of all, uh, in order to build that team. The, the, the second one is you must nurture uh, their expectation. You know, the, the people around you, the people that God has put together always need to be encouraged into the expectation of what God uh, is busy doing in their lives. And so this means a, a place of coaching. When it gets to a discipleship culture, we need to coach people into their different roles. Um, otherwise, the Bible says that the sheep will scatter. If there's no shepherd, if, if we can't pastor and um, shepherd people's hopes and dreams to, uh, toward where God is leading us. And, um, and I love what Eddie Jones actually said about the English rugby team. And I know, um, you know, the South Africans don't necessarily want to hear this, but, um, but it's, it's beautiful to see the kind of culture that they've established in being a team, being a a significant um, bunch of people being together and enjoying one another's company. And he said, you know, that there was this one player that actually was always struggling to be part of the team. And and uh, he, he always, when a player is not performing as a coach, he tells himself that he is failing. Um, and he goes back to the drawing board. And so, he said uh, immediately he went and spent time with this player and he realized that um, there was actually something that he loves, that he's passionate about. Um, and that was chess. And he said, um, so he, he found out from some of the other players in the team who loves playing test or can play chess. And so in that, they then started to play through the night even, <laughs> you know, chess um, on their camps and, and time together. Um, so that they can include this guy. And immediately he just started to, uh, to get so excited about being part of the team because other players wanted to engage into something that he loves doing. I remember um, Peter, Kir Peter Kirsten, no, sorry, Gary Kirsten, um, being the, the Indian um, cricket coach. And um, he said, uh, coaching Tendulkar, he said to Tendulkar, listen, I can teach you nothing because you are the best, um, you know, batsman in the world. But one thing I can do is to support you to become even better. And so he would for hours just throw the ball on the pitch uh, so that Tendulkar can just um, practice his shots. And, um, and in doing so, they became friends. They became um, close. And so I want to just say to you, discipleship means that you need to spend time with people and you must nurture their expectation. <laughs> And you must help them to become part, to, to feel part um, in everything that they do. And so thirdly, broken people can be great leaders and they can be great disciples. <laughs> um, past hurt happens to all of us. And so insecurities hinder us to, to, to become, you know, the people that God wants us to be. And we need to um, help people to, to grow from their brokenness, to not be victims, but to be the conquerors um, and the kings that God has called them to be. And this is a challenge. Whenever we start to disciple people and they are broken, it is a big challenge to, to help them to not think of themselves of just being on the receiving end of you know, negativity and, um, and, and, and speaking against their uh, identity to a place where they start to get excited about themselves and their contribution that they can, can make. And so, but Paul actually gave us the answer. He said that when we are weak, he is strong. And this is not a place of, you know, um, uh, a victimhood. This is a place where Paul knew that whenever he can recognize his weakness, God can become strong in his life. And so one thing that we do need to say to ourselves is if we want to become like Christ, Christ is not depressed. Christ 
is not weak and he's not um, downtrodden. He's a victor. And because we embrace his image, because we are becoming like Christ, we are allowing um, ourselves to become victors. That we realize that, listen, I don't need to feel intimidated because I've got Christ in me. I'm putting the cloak of Christ on me. And I realize that I've been called for a purpose for a day such as this. And because Christ is with me, I can um, take on the world. And so, so help broken people to become the greatest leaders. And I can tell you the most broken people are the best disciples in the world because they've come to their last. They learn how to actually give up themselves and start to trust in God's plan and purpose for their lives and find their identity in who Christ have made them to be. And so uh, fourthly, when it gets to, uh, you know, the team that we are building is we need momentum and momentum cannot be fabricated. It must be nurtured. Um, you know, it was beautiful. I went on a mission to Malawi um, a few years ago and, uh, you know, we, uh, we cycled from church to church. I think it was about 500 kil kilometers in five days. And, and, um, and so, um, so I, because I had a little bit more weight, always struggled, you know, to get to the uphills. Um, and um, it was amazing, the teammates, uh, Jankor and Rick and those guys, you know, how they would um, sometimes just get behind me and, um, and just uh, push me even uphill. And, um, but the one thing I always remember, you know, uh, Yanko said to me, um, you know, the law of kinetics, just make sure that when you go downhill, that you, you know, you cycle as hard as you can. Don't then rest um, because that momentum will help you to get uphill again. And, um, and so what I want to say is when it gets to church and discipleship, we need momentum in people's lives in growing, which means that, we sometimes get discouraged when people don't grow because it feels like it's a never ending story. They are not um, you know, fulfilling the things that we want them to fulfill. And the only question that we must ask ourselves is, are they better off than they've been a year ago? Because we all fall, but just make sure to fall forward. <laughs> that, that we, when we fall, just make sure to stand up to face you know, the music and to say, okay, I'm not there yet, but I'm, I'm going to look forward. I'm going to stand up and, and, and do what Christ has called. That momentum helps us to grow on momentum and to encourage one another and to say, listen, yeah, it's fine that you fall, but stand up and, and let's go again. But next year, yeah, this time, you're going to be a better person. Um, and so that, that's how it works with building a team as well, is we need momentum. If you don't have positive momentum, you will lose hope and you will you will be discouraged. And, and when we disciple one another, we must always keep it in perspective. We're not going to get everything right now. Um, and so I always encourage the guys here at the local church in, in London as well. I say the little flames, you know, there's, there's maybe not a felt fire yet. And it's not, um, you know, a time of awakening and, you know, big breakthroughs. But but just be sure to, to celebrate the little breakthroughs that you get. Because if you can fan that little flame, it will become a felt fire eventually. So, so let's just appreciate what God is doing right now and start to celebrate that in our lives and celebrate that in the growth of people around us and not be discouraged with, with where we are at and because we are not where we want to be, but to grow into a place where we can say, Thank you, God, for what you have done in my life. I want to grow to become more. I want to, I want to see that felt fire. Um, and so just make sure not to get negative momentum because that's very difficult to, um, to, to, to then change into a positive growth curve in your life and in people's lives around you. And so I want to just say, where do you start? Even in a church, you know, where do we start to establish that um, culture of discipleship? You start with one or two people. You don't start with the masses. You start to, to at least spend time with, you know, the, the two, or pe uh, two or three people that already are um, receiving from you. And you guys grow together. And as you grow, 
you know, you allow others to then um, spend time with them. And that is how the felt fire starts to happen, is when we can do it with two, the potential is there to let it become, you know, the, the massive influx of, of God's blessings um, through our lives. So don't be discouraged when you're in a small group and the small group is not happening at this stage. Start with the one or two people that God is at this stage giving little flames to. And, and, and just fan those little flames. And sometimes we are so spending time in the dead works in our lives and trying to improve that and try to sort that out in our lives. Then, and, um, and it's not becoming felt fires. But we forget that there must be a little flame, a pilot light, um, in order to initiate, to start off with. And so even in our small groups, Let's start on one or two people that are fired up at this stage and uh, and let's walk a road with them so that they will become the people that God is. And they will eventually multiply whatever is in their hearts and they and they. But this takes time. And so a discipleship culture is one where we realize that we need time and we need commitment to walk in relationship with people. Um and, and that's not going to happen overnight, but there is an explosion happening when the momentum does start to, uh, to turn around. Um, but let's be committed to, to the little things and appreciate the little things that God has already done in our lives. So lastly, um, fifthly, when it gets to building a team is uh, kill religion through discipleship. <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's strange how we still allow religion to, to dictate our churches, um, for religion and religious works to to uh, to reign over us. Have fun, you know. When it gets to building a team, you must have fun together. You know, it's especially the prophetic people and you know the teachers even find it so difficult to set time aside also for social events and you know just to go and play golf and and, and go to a rugby game or whatever together for the girls drinking um, tea together um because it's it's time not you know we've got so few uh, time um times together and um we uh, we are so limited in our uh, ability to to get to one another and disciple people but we forget that when people enjoy it they receive and so we must be part of people's lives um, I always say the best discipleship moments um, always happen in my life when um, when I or in other people's lives through me when we serve together in organizing an event or you know putting a bulb in together and doing stuff for the kingdom, because those are the times when you speak into one another, where you ask questions, where you, you know, just enjoy spending time together. And so maybe I should just read this. The pursuit of grace whilst holding people to account is essential to personal growth. Growth, But an environment of mercy whilst holding on to discipline and honesty, challenging each other, is vital to genuine discipleship and growth. Um, so yes, you know, we're going to pursue grace and we're going to uh, allow one another to grow in, uh, difficult um, circumstances, but, you know, we must also teach people that, um, to become holy is to also hold on to the disciplines that God wants to, uh, instill in our lives so that we can overcome those bad habits and sinful nature, um, that we have in our lives. But this is walking a road together. And this is uh, trusting God for, you know, for, for breakthroughs in one another's lives. Unless we commit ourselves to, as a church, get back to a culture of, of discipleship, we will not be the mighty army that God has called us to be. And so my challenge to you as the church, as people in the church is, to, to say today, listen, the biggest difference between churches that is radical for Christ and churches that is religious and, um, and find themselves to be dead and, 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 and not excited about Christ is a discipleship culture. Is people that are committed to live a radical cause of Christ. And so 
So for us as the church, uh, we need to get back to this culture. We need to challenge ourselves and we need to, uh, to grow into a radical living toward what Christ has called us to be, to be. And so I want to just end off with a few questions that you might um, be able to use in your, um, in your church uh, to challenge yourselves. And the first one is, what is the culture of discipleship currently in your church and in your life? Uh, secondly, what are you um, fed up for in the past and also desperate to see change in, your, in you and other people's discipleship work in, um, in church and in your life? Uh, thirdly, how can you build a team that is on a mission together? Um, fourthly, who are the three people that you are walking a road with currently? And how do you foresee connecting with them in the future? Our ability to disciple people are limited because of time and ability to impart um, at the right times. So effectively, we can't disciple more than two or three people at a time, which means that we need to, to um, encourage them to do the same through their lives. Because if they can, each one then, uh, disciple two or three people, and they then two or three people, we can see a, a culture of discipleship happening in our lives. But who are the three people that you currently are committed to in seeing... Um, Christ established in their lives, to become more like Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name for the ability to disciple, but also the ability to be disciple, to allow people to speak into our lives, to open our hearts and to want to learn more through people of the faith around us, Father God. And, um, and we pray, Father, for, you know, for a culture to be established among us, where we will um, be on a journey together, where we will as a team just trust you for amazing breakthroughs together and to start to celebrate even the breakthroughs that is in the people around us, even more so than in our own lives. We thank you for the privilege of being disciple makers and being part of your kingdom and that you entrust such a beautiful culture to us. Lead us, Christ. Lead us to become more like you. In Jesus' name.